We all live in the digital world. We all need it to be open and safe. We all want to trust. And to be trusted. We all despise control. And desire freedom. We, we are all united. united. Welcome again. I also want to welcome all the participants that are joining us virtually. I don't have access to the Zoom room myself, but my colleagues do. Um, so I urge people in the room to communicate with those online that are not with us physically um, so that they can feel part of the session. Um, this United Nations Open Forum at the IJF is very significant. It's actually historical. It's the first time, to my knowledge, that we have this type of open forum. We have where we have um, senior heads and very senior staff of UN agencies um, here to join how internet governance is relevant to their work and how they are contributing to the broader process of inclusive, collaborative, um, development-oriented internet governance. Um, and one of the specific aspects of internet governance, which I think we're all realizing as an IGF community, is that internet governance and internet-related public policy issues and decisions cannot be isolated. They cannot be concentrated and localized in any one sphere, in any one agency. The internet is so ubiqu ubiquitous and it touches so many aspects of social, political, and economic and security lives that um, we all have to engage in aspects of internet-related policy and governance, and we see that very strongly across the UN system. So um, to, to, to start us, and we're running a little bit late, so I'm going to go straight to our esteemed panel, and I want to first give the floor to Under Secretary General from UNDESA, the United Nations Division for Economic and Social Affairs, which is the institutional home of, of the IJF in the UN system. Um, Mr. Liu Zenmin, um, who is an IJF regular and um, I think who understands the IJF and the role and the relationship between the UN and the IJF very well. Um, Mr. Liu, you have the floor. Thank you, thank you, Arinda. Uh, dear colleagues, uh, I'm so honored to be here, join with you. Before uh, making some, offering some comments, let me first, I want to thank Arinda, the chair uh, of the multi-stakeholder advisor group. Uh, over the past two years, I want to thank her and her his colleague, her colleagues of the MAG, that before their efforts uh, over the, uh, in organizing the IGF and you, 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 you supporting the IGF process over the past two years under very difficult circumstances. Uh, second, I also want to thank all my UN colleagues, I think especially uh, not only for this session, but also for, for, for your support and your, your co-sponsorship of the last year's session, which you convened by the UN system virtually. Uh, this year, luckily, I think uh, with the improvement of the, of the, the uh, scenario situation in you know, mitigating pandemic, we have been able to, to meet in kind of its, uh, you know, hybrid format. But in even hybrid, I think uh, we, we, we continue to count on strong support of UN system families. I think this is the process, IGF processes that we, we, we should depend on, the, 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 the support of multi-stakeholders, as well as UN system, uh, UN, UN system family members. So, uh, dear colleagues, UN family has increasingly engaged in IGF-related activities, sharing their expertise with multi-stakeholders while also listening to their views and the voices. Such interactions and collaboration continue to be beneficial to all and to the entire internet uh, uh, community. Many UN entities have been supporting intergovernment processes, contributing to international norm setting and the digital cooperation. The voices from the stakeholders can help 
enrich such contributions. And other young entities have carried out analytical work covering digital government, digital economy, access to information, and digital connectivity, and cybersecurity. I know that many colleagues are going to share your experience in, the, in all these respects. So it is critical that we hear back from our civil society, technical community, and the business partners. Otherwise, governments on how we can further improve our analytical outputs. Increasingly, many UN organizations have also been scaling up capacity building, helping countries to apply digital technologies to bridge digital divides, improve public service delivery, and deliver and develop their digital economies. Dear colleagues, we can do a better job if these efforts are undertaken in partnership with stakeholder groups. Importantly, these collaborative initiatives are now made possible because of the internet and the digital technologies. Virtual meetings, shared document collaboration, and conferences held online are, are some of the tools that facilitate such cooperation. The digital response to the COVID-19 pandemic had really demonstrated the value of digital technology, but not for all people. Indeed, the advance of digital technologies has exacerbated inequalities in many situations. And we, this is one of the lessons we learned for over the past two years. So we have seen consequences of children not being connected online, employees unable to work remotely due to lack of de the devices or connectivity, and social relations at, street, at stress because of isolation, just because of one fact, the digital divide and the lack of access and the connectivity. So it is incumbent on the young family to be part of a global undertaking for a better, safer internet for all. By being at the IGF, you are indeed doing so. So UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres has laid out a clear advice for the IGF to adapt, in, innovate, and reform. So the IGF is a good platform for us to exchange our experiences in working on the digital ecosystem, digital policy, and digital capacity building. So dear colleagues, I invite you to speak today on what you see as the imperative for the human family, to make the internet a better place for all people on our planet, and especially to harness digital transformation for standard development. It is my sincere wish that this type of gathering becomes our tradition at every year's IGF. And this is my, my fifth, fifth, fifth one. I thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Liu. We'll now hear from various of the UN agencies that, that are represented online and in the room. And I trust that all of them will keep to their time limit because then we'll be able to have an interactive debate about how within the UN system and also within this context of the multi-stakeholder processes that the IGA facilitates, and um, how UN agencies and other organizations in the UN system can work together better to, to lead um, digital transformation in support of achieving the SDGs. Um, next, I'm delighted to invite uh, Ms. Michelle Conanz. I have no idea if I cor correctly pronounce that. And she's the executive director of the UN Counterterrorism Ex um, Executive Directorate. And uh, Michelle, please go ahead and tell us more about how you engage with internet governance. Thanks a lot, Madam uh, Chair. And Excellency, distinguished participants, uh, 
A big thank you to the organisers of IGF uh, for convening the timely event to bring together the UN entities to discuss our work on ICT and other aspects uh, relating to digital technologies. And as you all are aware, we face immense challenges in our efforts to prevent and counter terrorist abuse of cyber domain. Terrorists and violent extremists both continue to exploit digital platforms to support their activities and produce online content as part of their violent attacks. The lockdown measures imposed during the COVID-19 pandemic have presented violent extremists and terrorists with captive online audiences in states around the globe. CTAT responses to these challenges seeks to reconcile the positive and a negative aspect of new technologies, namely their considerable potential to improve our quality of life on the one hand and their vulnerabilities uh, to abuse by terrorists on the other. And CETA's primary function is to assist the Security Council's Counterterrorism Committee to monitor, facilitate and promote Member States' implementation of the relevant Council resolutions on terrorism, including by facilitating technical assistance delivery. And in doing so, we work to help states, all the states uh, in the globe, the 193 uh, states, to develop ways to prevent use of the internet for terrorist purposes and create innovative technological solutions in compliance with their obligations on the international law. Already 20 years ago, the Council noted the use of new technologies by terrorists in adopting its Security Council Resolution 1373. And since that moment, 2001, the Council has adopted 13 terrorism-related resolutions and four policy frameworks that address ICT issues. In accordance with those resolutions, CTAX um, is uh, addressing inter alia the following topics gathering digital data and supporting online investigations, strengthening international cooperation for legal access to electronic evidence, countering online terrorist narratives, gathering and sharing biometric and biographic information, protection of critical infrastructure, cyber security, preventing the use of ICT to facilitate the trafficking of persons and preventing the use of new financial instruments by terrorists. Throughout these activities, respect for the rule of law and human rights are mainstreamed. For instance, we address the data protection and privacy concerns, as well as human rights and gender concerns relating to the programming and use of artificial intelligence and algorithmic systems, particularly those used in law enforcement and border control. We also analyze new trends in the use of ICT for terrorist purposes, such as cyber-based fundraising methods, and the use of gaming platforms for incitement to commit terrorist act and recruit the next generation of violent extremists and terrorists. Distinguished participants, this was a very brief bird's eye view of CTAT's engagement on ICT issues. And terrorists and organized criminals continue to abuse abuse uh, the internet, social media, and other components of cyber domain, CDES work on ICT issues will continue to be both relevant and necessary. And in conclusion, let me show that CDES will continue to explore ways to assist member states to address these issues, working closely with all other partners, including the private sector, civil society, members of our global research network, UN entities, and a broad range of international and regional organizations. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for, for that, Michelle. And I hope we can come back to discuss that in more depth because it overlaps, your work overlaps um, closely with conversations that are taking place here um, at the IGF. Next, I'm very pleased to give the floor to Mr. Taufik Jalassi, the Assistant Director General for Communications and Information at UNESCO. Um, UNESCO having a very particular place in the history of the IGF through the key role it played as one of the lead agencies involved in the World Summit on the Information Society um, from which the IGF emerged. Taufik. Thank you very much, uh, Henriette. Pleased to be here with the senior UN uh, officials. I would like to make three quick points. Uh, and thank you for saying that uh, UNESCO has been involved uh, from the WSIS summit back in 2003 in Geneva and 2005 in Tunis, and uh, was very much at the foundation of the IGF back then. My first point is that we, UNESCO has been advocating for 
what we call the Rome framework for digital governance and internet governance. What is Rome, R-O-A-M? It's a human rights-based, open, accessible, and multi-stakeholder approach. We believe that this is the right approach going forward. We are delighted that so far 34 countries have adopted the UNESCO Rome framework and our internet universality indicators to conduct national digital assessment. And I invite more countries to join us uh, and carry out their national digital readiness and assessment through our 300 plus internet indicators and our Rome framework. That's my first point. My second point is UNESCO has been, uh, if not the leading UN agency, is certainly a leading UN agency when it comes to the freedom of expression, the safety of journalists, and uh, the addressing the issue of impunity for crimes committed against journalists. So when you talk about the internet, of course, this is the cyberspace and freedom of expression is central uh, in that cyberspace. Uh, so it's not only in terms of fostering the freedom of expression, but also combating uh, hate speech, speech of violence, of extremism. Uh, so all, let's say, the negative sides of misusing uh, the internet, including misinformation and disinformation. In my intervention at the high-level panel yesterday afternoon, I suggested the approach of, the, of UNESCO, which is not very much to opt for a laissez-faire approach, nor for an over-regulated approach, but rather to try really to put some pressure and also to advocate for a transparency of internet companies and digital platforms, because we believe that is the proper way forward. In the 30 seconds left to me, let me briefly make my third point. Two weeks ago, the 193 member states of UNESCO have unanimously adopted the UNESCO recommendation on the ethics of artificial intelligence. This is a groundbreaking achievement. This is the first global normative instrument of its kind to, uh, regarding the field of AI, which we know it's not an emerging technology, it's already the, the technology of today, and we have heard so many benefits that can be achieved, but also many harms that the misuse of this technology can lead us to. So this recommendation on the ethics of the, inter of the uh, AI, we believe is very important uh, to have the proper safeguards, not only in the, in the use of the, uh, of the AI, but also the design and the development of AI-based applications and systems. Let me stop with these three points, and maybe later on I'll have the chance to add to them. Thank you, Henriette. Thank you, Taufik, and I do hope we, we, we can come back to that. Um, and next, I am very happy to invite and welcome from um, the virtual space, I can see him, um, on the screen, Mr. Mario Cimoli, who is the Deputy Executive Secretary of ECLAC, the Economic Commission for Latin American and the Caribbean, another agency that was very active during the World Summit on the Information Society process. Mario. Are you there? I don't see uh, Mario, well, I can't hear Mario. So possibly um, he has not been able to join us, um, and maybe he still will. But next I will go to you, Maria Francesca. Maria Francesca Spatolisano, the Assistant Secretary General um, within UNDESA, but currently the officer in charge of the Office of the Envoy for Technology um, to the UN Secretary General, Maria Francesca. Thank you very much, Henriette, and I hope we see Mario very soon. Uh, so, dear colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, I speak today, as Henriette said, in my capacity as the officer in charge of the Office of the Secretary General's Envoy on Technology at the United Nations. This office is tasked with the coordination uh, of the follow-up to the Secretary General's Roadmap for Digital Cooperation, which lays out the Secretary General's call 
to connect, respect, and protect everyone, everywhere, in order to build a more open, free, and secure digital future for all. This was reinforced as goal in the recent report on uh, our common agenda that was presented by the Secretary General in September. So the Office of the Tech Envoy works in an inclusive and open manner, particularly through multi-stakeholder partnership, and I don't have to tell this to the IGF, which is by definition multi-stakeholder, and a strong collaboration with the UN entities, and here they are all very well represented, and in particular, of course, we have prioritized to bring together the UN system to better serve the developing countries, those underserved communities, and leaving no one behind in this area. So let me uh, say a few words about how we do all this. The roadmap has set the target of achieving universal meaningful connectivity by 2030 and connecting the unconnected. There is 2.9 billion still uh, who have not used the, the net, even though they may be under coverage of the net, but they don't use it, and there are several reasons uh, to that. Moreover, the roadmap has also called for more coherent and coordinated global effort at digital capacity building. Here I come back to the underserved community. Because achieving real and sustained progress in various dimensions of digitalization requires skills development, effective training, and this is done in many uh, ways uh, throughout the UN system, of course. This is why, for instance, the Tech Envoy Office has worked with the United Nations Development Coordination Office, the DCO, we call it, and other key UN agencies like ITU, UNDP, UNICEF, and we have established a roadmap response team, we call it, to partner with the UN resident coordinators and country teams and better support the countries on the ground. Tomorrow morning at the IGF uh, sessions, uh, this office, together with ITU and UNDP, will also be launching uh, a multi-stakeholder network on digital capacity development, which includes a, we call it again, it's jargon, you will forgive me, but you're all aware of this <laughs> clearinghouse function. And it's powered by a joint facility, jointly by ITU and UNDP. And this will help direct specific requests for support, for capacity building, for uh, uh, training, to potential providers of digital capacity building initiatives. So it's a clearinghouse matching demand and offer. We are also working closely with the Office of the High Representative for the least developed countries, landlocked developing countries, and small island um, states, uh, and the Technology Bank for LDCs in view of the LDCs Plus Five Summit next year, recognizing that access and utilization to digital technologies will be critical in supporting enabling LDC to build back better. They can leapfrog really through some technology towards sustainable development and providing services uh, uh, to their uh, uh, population. So across the entire spectrum of the roadmap, our office also collaborates closely with UN agencies to better harness the potential of digital technologies and addressing the challenges. For example, with DESA, uh, we are initiating a UN system-wide mapping of digital-related initiatives to catalyze better collaboration and coordination. And the synergies with the STI forum are being explored so that um, we can leverage you know, the respective strength. And we partner with so many other agencies, for instance, space-based technologies, artificial intelligence for road safety, um, other emergency responses. I mean, this office is a little bit a hub and works with all sorts of other entities in the UN family. There are many examples. I can't uh, quote uh, everyone. I wish I could, but I can't. But let me reiterate how important it is for this small office of the Tech Envoy to 
be you know, connected and uh, working with everybody and don't hesitate, of course, to, to let us know how we can do that better. Thank you very much. Thanks, Francesca. Um, next, and um, I have been informed by the Secretariat that Mr. Chimoli did send an apology, so I just did not receive it in time. So I'm afraid he won't be able to join us. But now um, I am giving the floor to Mr. Ib Peterson, who is the Deputy Executive Director of the United Nations Population Fund. Ib, please let us hear from you. Yeah, thank you, and uh, thanks for the opportunity to be here. Uh, uh, and uh, I think I will take a point of departure in uh, what you actually asked us, uh, how does uh, internet governance relate to, to our work? Of course, it relates a lot. Uh, UNFPA being the uh, family and reproductive health uh, agency of the UN, we are working, I mean, there's a lot about access, uh, in particular for women and, and adults and girls, women and girls. Uh, but one particular thing that we are working to, to fight and prevent is gender-based violence as one of our three major, what we call, uh, transformative uh, results in our strategic plan. And that is really uh, where uh, you, there is a need for strengthened internet governance and also to, to work together. In fact, we launched last week uh, a new campaign uh, on the media, on the platform called Body Rights. Uh, it actually highlights uh, that you know, um, corporate logos and copyrighted IPs are more highly valued and, and better protected uh, on online and on the net than are you know uh, images of people's bodies. So we launched this uh, body right campaign um, to demand protection from online violence, in particular against women, uh, but all uh, of course. But women and girls are uh, hardest hit. Uh, we know from, uh, for instance, the Economist Intelligence uh, Unit uh, that 85% of women with access to internet reported witnessing online violence against other women, and 38% experienced uh, it personally. 65% um, have experienced cyber harassment, uh, hate speech, and defamation. Um, so this is certainly uh, an, an, an area where there is a need to call upon uh, a number of actors, uh, and that's what we're trying to do with this campaign, and this is uh, why this meeting today is also extremely uh, timely, and, and we appreciate the opportunity here. It is a global call uh, to, uh, to action for uh, to, to shop, disrupt violence against women and girls in virtual spaces, and we all need to understand our role in that uh, and work together to, to drive the real change. Um, online protection for every girl women and young person everywhere. It's a call to individuals that need to step up, uh, not only uh, men and boys and others uh, uh, who can refuse to commit violence, they can also speak uh, speak up and act. It's also a call to the tech companies to stay, uh, that they need to step up as well. Um, uh, we, we're actually demanding that uh, digital and social uh, media platforms, uh, online forums and content sites uh, provide women and girls the same protection as they do for cover, copyrighted materials, uh, which, they, which is not the case today. So it's a question of uh, providing reporting processes and tools for users that must be accessible, easy to use and responsive, and platforms should uh, support users in, in, managing, in managing and controlling who can see, share, and comment on their content. It's also a call to policymakers and governments uh, uh, and they simply cannot continue to ignore uh, that this is, uh, this is uh, one of the uh, major challenges uh, when it comes to fighting uh, also gender-based violence. So we appeal to policymakers through this campaign also to adopt, amend and implement clear legislation to criminalize the non-consensual use and the misuse and abuse of people's images online and create also legal obligations, moderation and reporting systems uh, for, uh, and for legal obligations for technology companies uh, and social media platforms. And here also, of course, civil society experts, uh, survivors themselves actually, should be involved in the design and the evaluation and the regulation. And this is some of the things that we would like to, uh, that we are trying to, uh, uh, to uh, promote now and make happen with this campaign. And we are, of course, extremely interested in working with the whole UN uh, family, the civil society, and with the tech companies, as I said, to, uh, to achieve these goals. 
So I'll stop there. That was a more concrete example, uh, but I just wanted to, uh, to point to that. Thanks. Thank you, Ib, and I won't dwell on it, but I do hope that at some point you've made use of the work done in the IGF, one of the best practice forums of the IGF, the one on gender, um, has actually done quite extensive work on combating gender-based violence online. And But we are hearing already, I think, from the complexity and the diversity that you and agencies are agencies are engaged both with combating harmful use of the internet but also enabling um, positive use. Um, next we have Mr. Masood Karimipur, the Chief of Terrorism Prevention Branch of the United Nations Office on Drugs and Crime. I hope I got that right. Um, Mr. Karimipur, you have the floor. Thank you, Henriette, uh, and uh, I join you from a uh, very gloomy Vienna where it's getting dark uh, already. Uh, distinguished colleagues, thank you for the opportunity to contribute to this uh, panel today. Uh, thanks to uh, uh, the organizers of the 16th annual meeting of the IGF. Um, we're also grateful for the opportunity to host a remote hub and an e-conversation on the topic of uh, human rights and electronic evidence which will take place this Friday to coincide with and commemorate uh, Human Rights Day. So let me quickly capture UNODC's ongoing support to member states in advancing information and communication technologies and digital innovations toward achieving the SDGs. Uh, our uh, five-year strategy is grounded in the Secretary General's reform agenda, including reforms on innovation, data, and digitalization. We're committed to and we're guided by the SDGs, especially Goal 16, which commits all countries to provide equal access to justice for all. Uh, we combine uh, our extensive presence on the ground uh, through our field offices with the provision of digital tools aimed at making criminal justice institutions more resilient, more effective, and uh, more able to cope with unexpected challenges such as the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. We've seen the rapid move to online space during the pandemic, highlighting the enormous potential, but also the enormous risks of digitization, which includes an increase in criminal and terrorist activity online, as Michelle pointed out. It's in this context that I'd like to elaborate on five of UNODC's programmatic areas, which help illustrate the extent to which uh, we're embracing an innovative digital approach in the delivery of our crime prevention and criminal justice mandates. First, the Global Initiative on Handling Electronic Evidence Across Borders, which was launched in 2017, together with the CTED, which Michelle heads, and the International Association of Prosecutors. Uh, through this uh, initiative, uh, we're leading the enhancement of public-private partnerships with member states, with international and regional organizations such as Eurojust, Europol, and the European Judicial Network, just to name a few, as well as communication service providers. We've developed online practical tools and resources such as the new one-stop window uh, for electronic evidence, electronic evidence hub, we're calling it, that provides a number of tools uh, and uh, other uh, valuable uh, uh, links uh, to strengthen the, uh, the use of electronic evidence. Next, uh, we're continuing to work with countries to strengthen their responses against the use of internet for terrorist purposes. In doing so, we have increased awareness about the legislative frameworks, investigative techniques, and the collecting of evidence in crimes involving the use of the internet. Next, uh, you know, DC's global program on cybercrime provides technical assistance and training to member states to prevent and counter cybercrime. The program works on four dimensions, capacity building, prevention, cooperation, and legal framework. Uh, next, uh, we have a full range of assistance on cryptocurrencies, which is part of our global program against money laundering through awareness raising workshops and e-learning courses uh, through which we help policymakers understand the blockchain technology uh, and address risks of cryptocurrency criminal use and the strategies to mitigate uh, such risks. We're also supporting member states in the development of legislation and regulation on cryptocurrencies. And last but not least, in 2019, the General Assembly established the Ad Hoc Committee to elaborate a comprehensive international convention on countering the use of ICTs for criminal purposes. 
Uh, the committee had its first session in May of 2021, after which the General Assembly adopted the, the resolution providing the roadmap for the negotiation of the convention. And the first session of the ad hoc committee will be held just next month uh, in New York. And we serve as the secretariat of this committee and will continue to actively support the committee in negotiating and drafting the convention. So let me stop here, Henriette. And again, thanks to organizers and to you. I'm handing it back to you. Thank you. Andrea. Thanks. Thanks very much, Masoud. We are running a bit out of time. So I don't want to put anyone on the spot, but if our contributors can be a little bit briefer than their allocated time, I would appreciate that. Um, now I'm very happy to um, invite um, Ms. Johanna Skocek, who's Poland's Deputy Permanent Representative at the Mission in New York. And she's here with us in the room. Thank you. Thank you very much, Madam Chair, and uh, thanks a lot, colleagues from DESA, for inviting me as the only representative of a member state. Thanks a lot, and I will share some of uh, observation from that perspective. Um, I think that we can discuss the UN digital activity uh, in two, uh, on two levels or in, in two areas. First, within the very mandate of the organization and its operation on both legal and practical levels. And second, in what concerns our daily work as member states together with uh, UN. Um, and this first, this first area that I will call uh, political for the lack of a better term, uh, it results from, um, from growing, the fact of growing importance of digital issues at the UN uh, and its whole family, as we can hear from all the participants here. Uh, so this, the, the digital agenda increasingly becomes the subject of debate of both uh, the most pressing global issues in the economic and social spheres, as well as the, in the context of the reforms of the organization itself. And this growing relevance of uh, digital um, connectivity and new technologies is fully and, in my view, perfectly described in the Secretary General new report, Our Common uh, Agenda, which, as we all know, among 12 commitments, also calls for improving digital cooperation and uh, in achieving universal digital uh, inclusivity. Uh, the objectives formulated uh, in, the, in the, our common agenda echo the concerns that are raised by member states, including my own country, uh, Poland, that uh, relate to digital inclusivity, protection of human rights, protection of data, uh, fighting disinformation and promoting digital literacy. And I would say that the two uh, latter, so fighting disinformation and uh, promoting digital literacy, is something that uh, connects with education and communication, and it is our common responsibility that we are more and more active in those two fields that we perceive and as probably the most important challenges. And now jumping to the second, uh, so more practically UN-related plan, uh, last month showed us how effective the UN can be in accommodating and adjusting to new challenges posed by COVID pandemic, when most of our work uh, moved from the General Assembly Hall and the conference rooms to the internet platforms. And although I am, I am convinced that the digitalization or digitalized diplomacy cannot replace real one and cannot replace people-to-people -people contact. Now, the usage of uh, IT enabled us to carry on uh, with our mission and with our daily work. And uh, also, uh, somehow it helped uh, with the inclusivity because it enabled people from all over the world to join events that otherwise would be only available for those physically present in New York, Geneva, Vienna, Rome, or Nairobi, or wherever. Uh, and our main challenge was to count properly the time difference. So although I hope that we will be back to, uh, in full to the conference rooms and, and GA, I think that there will be some silver lining of the pandemic that will stay with us, that we will always remember about uh, our colleagues and stakeholders 
who are all over the world and who can also participate. And I just would like to sum up saying that uh, today UN is the only global organization that can help us tackle these challenges together. Uh, first of all, uh, leading by example, uh, also giving the platform for exchange of good practices, uh, but also assist uh, itself and uh, UN member states uh, in the implementation of the solutions that will help us to achieve these goals. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And thank you to Poland for being responsible for us all being here. And now I'm inviting Mr. Maximo Torero, who is the chief economist at the Food and Agricultural Organization. I hope he's speaking from Rome, which is a very wonderful city that I love very much. You have the floor. Uh, thank you, thank you, thank you very much, uh, and it's a pleasure to, to be here. Let me start saying uh, that digital technologies and applications can create significant social and environmental benefits and accelerate the progress towards SDGs, and that's what we aim at FAO, especially SDG 2, 1, and 10, which are our priorities, but of course all the other SDGs are linked to that. And the power of data and technology can harness to reduce the digital divide, which today is extremely important right now, and, but also could help us to achieve the 2030 agenda, but we need to understand that this is not a panacea. There are many issues that we need to take into consideration. So there are six principles that we follow, and this is linked to the, to the, uh, the, the Rome uh, Vatican Declaration uh, of Ethics uh, on Artificial Intelligence, which are transparency, inclusion, responsibility, impartiality, reliability, and security and privacy. Those are the for us, the core six principles in which we operate in all the activities uh, we do. And why is this so important? Because today we have some e uh, problems regarding uh, enabling policy environment to support in-country investments in digital agriculture. We still need to do a significant effort to reduce inequality in access, which is significant, especially in broadband. And that requires also inclusivity in gender and youth. So the principle of inclusivity of inclusion is central. Uh, and we need to strengthen also international cooperation to ensure that increased and targeted investments are made to specifically address this digital divide so that it's reliable and also assures that there is a security and privacy in the information we provide. The position of FAO is to strengthen the focus on digital for impact, and FAO priorities are to further accelerate the use of innovative technologies and to continue to improve on a portfolio of ICT services tools that will contribute to achieve SDG worldwide, but also within the five principles that I mentioned before. We bring solutions for the agri-food system, which is a lot more than just agriculture. It goes across the whole interlinkages, so it's the value chains plus the interlinkages from the farm to the consumer, but all the interlinkages which, with the other sectors, which require significant levels of innovation. And we also try to share best practices through our international platform of digital food and agriculture, which is hosted at FAO and which aims to be able to bring access to information and to, uh, and to institutions that are required to be able to reduce the digital divide and to be able to make farmers and producers and consumers uh, profit from these digital technology innovations. Within this, we have several initiatives. One of our priority initiatives is the Hand in Hand Initiatives, which tries to integrate to digital solutions, to bring solutions through territorial approaches to countries. And countries are the ones which lead what we do under this initiative. One of the first outputs that we generated was what we call the Hand in Hand Geospatial Platform, which builds on the latest advance in ICT and geography and federates and integrates data on crops, livestock, land, water, climate, fisheries, forestry, trade, and socioeconomic factors. It also allows us to increase our effectiveness in terms of our impact. Second, we have a series of sets of, of resilience tools, which are linked to our early warning systems. One is on water productivity through open access remotely sensed data, which is called WAPOR. Uh, also to look at the stress of water, which is the ACES tool that we have made public and also the RICAR tool, which looks at climate change risk assessments. All of those are essential today to be able to make, be more inclusive in, ter in terms of increasing resilience. But also we have to put enormous effort on prediction and early warning tools, 
uh, like uh, the platform of global action for full army warm control, uh, the foot price monitor that we have in place, and also uh, information about forest and land monitoring too. Why is this so important? Because in the world we are living today, which there is significant volatility because of climate and because of temp uh, extremes in temperature and, and increasing variance of temperature, is central to help countries through information respecting the five principles that will allow them to increase the way they produce and to reduce their uncertainty so that they can make better choices. Finally, we also have a portfolio of digital services, which is linked to our 1000 Digital Village initiative. In the digital villages, what we are trying to bring together is a combination of different dimensions, three main dimensions. E-agriculture, where our platform of tools for agriculture are present, but also we want to have e-village, which brings benefits at the village level to farmers, and also uh, we have a, a perspective in which we want to bring uh, digital services for non-farm activities so that we can diversify incomes of farmers. So those are the ways we are trying to, to bring uh, to, to support the process of achieving the SDGs, respecting, as I, I said again, the five principles, transparency, inclusion, responsibility, impartiality, reliability, and security and privacy. Thank you very much. Thanks, Maximo. Um, and now, Mr. Robin Geis, Director of the United Nations Division for Disarmament Research. Robin. Thanks very much uh, and for having us today. It's a great pleasure to be here. So yes, uh, the United Nations Institute for Disarmament Research, UNIDIR, we are uh, an autonomous institution within the UN and really a think tank that provides independent research and innovative ideas and not just on disarmament, but on international security issues more broadly. And of course, uh, in a time of growing global mistrust, and in which we're seeing you know, an, a surge in malicious cyber activity, an increase in attack surfaces, just think of the home office and what that has done um, to do attack surfaces, more sophisticated attack vectors uh, in cyberspace, and certainly new types of digital arms races that go across economic, scientific, and traditional military fields. And in such an area, it comes to no surprise that for our research institute, cybersecurity, digital security is, of course, at the forefront of our uh, activities. And our security and technology program really is uh, designed to dynamically keep pace with all uh, the rapid uh, evolutions that we're seeing in the digital space. Um, and uh, it's really structured, and I'm simplifying a little bit across three main work streams. Cyber stability, the implications of artificial intelligence, and not just in weapon systems, but in military decision-making, security-related decision-making generally. And then thirdly, we're looking at over-the-horizon technologies, new trends, what's coming next, that's increasingly important. And I think in that regard, the convergence of the different technologies really deserves significant attention. It's not just cyber, not just AI and silos. It's uh, the synergetic effects of these various technologies coming together, and that includes new sensor technology uh, and uh, advancements in robotics. And, and all of that taken together is what is shaping our reality uh, and what uh, holds a lot of benefits, but also certain risks, and they require our attention. Now, you've asked us to keep uh, this brief, uh, and I'm watching uh, the clock, so let me just uh, give you a few examples of, of some of our research uh, activities in the digital field. We're very much involved with our research in uh, pursuing options for confidence building, capacity building, confidence building, clearly not an easy ask in this new, rapidly evolving environment. The UNIDIR cyber policy portal is, is one item that I would like uh, to put on the map on the table here today. Um, it brings together the various policy uh, pronouncements from states across the globe. It helps to build transparency uh, because others can check what others are doing. It also helps to build confidence and capacity because it provides a range of examples of how certain issues and challenges in the cyber domain can be uh, addressed. It's uh, heavily referenced in all the intergovernmental cyber processes at the UN and recurring currently looking into making it even more interactive and more uh, accessible. Then secondly, UNIDIA has a traditional and strong role in working towards the operationalization 
of norms of responsible state behavior. And we do this through multi-stakeholder dialogues. Unity is very much a bridge builder between uh, the many stakeholders involved and clearly also the private sector and trying to bring them more into traditionally very state-centered security debates. So a combination of multi-stakeholder events and research activities, um, and just really to give you the flavor of what we're doing, <clears throat> most recent reports have focused on supply chain security, uh, responsible vulnerability disclosure, international cooperation in the event of a cyber incident affecting critical infrastructure, and then also expectations and uh, explanations to due diligence in cyberspace. And lastly, public-private coordination, cooperation when it comes to international law implementation. Last but not least, and I'll uh, conclude here, we are very much uh, involved in supporting the various intergovernmental UN processes on norm development in uh, the digital domain. Uh, as you know, the GGE and the open-ended working group earlier this year came to a successful conclusion, both of them, and now there is a new open-ended working group with a five-year mandate just about to start uh, in a week or so. Uh, and of course, a five-year mandate provides ample opportunity uh, to advance discussions on cybersecurity at the UN uh, and UNIDIA will be very much uh, supporting uh, this process. Thank you very much. Thanks, thanks, Robert. And I've been watching that closely in my capacity as a commissioner of the Global Commission on um, Cyber Stability. Um, Kate, who is with us in the room, um, Kate McBride, the director of the ICT Policy Division of the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change. Hello, thank you. Nice to see everyone. Um, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, and it's a great pleasure to be here today to present how the Climate Change Secretariat is supporting the digital transformation and how we strategically partner to unleash digital information and innovation to address the climate crises. Following the excellent presentations and discussions yesterday and today, I would like to go over some of the various ways that we're using digital technologies for inclusivity and collaboration. This year, we launched a new digital platform to enhance the experience and significantly expand the participation in Glasgow at COP26. The platform included a virtual and on-site digital ID registration, hybrid networking um, capabilities, and then the ability to participate in person or virtually or both, like many of us are doing here. Um, through the digital platform, we were able to increase the participation from an expected 30,000 participants to 50,000, 20,000 participants participating solely virtually. The new platform is a result of experiences of the last year, which we've suffered and perhaps to a certain extent found a silver lining in how we could participate from anywhere with everyone. We went to a fully virtual intercession meetings and then the hybrid at the COP in Glasgow. In the face of these many COVID challenges, many of the digital technologies did allow us to progress and maintain the climate process moving forward. And one of the consequences has clearly been broader participation and inclusivity, both from governments, but multi-stakeholders and non-actors, such as civil society, indigenous people, and a very large outcry from youth to participate in our activities. Following COP26, we continued to develop and innovate the digital platform to increase the effectiveness and inclusivity and transparency of the climate process to bring more people in to do more for each other and for our planet. Secondly, another big area that we have been working is in the area of data. The Secretariat provides the Nazca platform where non-state actors transparently inform on their voluntary efforts and progress. And this provides a continuously evolving picture of non-state actors, commitments, actions, and enhancements. Thirdly, the Climate Change Secretariat is supporting capacity building and social engagement through climate education and the use of digital technologies. We've partnered with more than 30 multilateral organizations led by the United Nations Institute for Training and Research to deliver an online platform with curated videos and training materials on climate change, and the platform is available to everyone with connectivity. The Secretariat also conducts capacity building workshops 
with developing countries through virtual workshops and seminars. And then lastly, we are working with the Resilience Frontier Initiative to design ambitious pathways towards long-term resilience by responding to the deep social transformations driven by the pandemic, technologies, and new trends in sustainability. It is at the forefront of the thinking on human sustainability and expanding planetary boundaries towards regenerative prosperity that the Resilient Frontiers is helping us approach this transformation. We're taking into the account the impact of technology and all of the factors that are leading to the state of we as a people and of our planet. We're looking at how artificial intelligence, big data, blockchain, autonomous systems, biotech, SAT technologies are driving change and defining pathways. Sorry. And how these various pathways are filled with many, many, many of our youth and a non-party stakeholders. And then just finally, in closing, we are looking at 2022 as a new era for climate change, for engagement, and the use of digital technologies to keep the forward pressure and ambition on climate action and to lead to concrete and effective solutions for current and future generations. Really, our goal is, is that every positive action mitigating the causes or effects of climate and a digital world will increase the resilience and the inclusivity we need to embrace the changes. I thank you for your time and your attention. Thank you very much, Kate. And please, everyone, I know we are at the end of the session, but we'll take a little bit of your time, not much, just bear with us. And we have one final speaker, Mr. Mark Williams, um, Practice Manager, Digital Development, Global Practice from the World Bank. Mark. Thank you, um, and good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. It's a real pleasure to have this opportunity to represent the World Bank at the IGF. And the World Bank, you know, is a multilateral organization, works in every major area of economic and social development and in the vast majority of developing countries. We provide a wide range array of financial products and technical assistance, and we help countries share and apply innovative knowledge and solutions to the challenges that they face. Now, digital development is an integral part of the bank's portfolio in every country that we work in. If we go back 30 years, this work was mainly focused on state-owned enterprises, telecoms companies, and reforming and improving the performance of those businesses. Then this was followed by a period of support on market reforms, liberalization, competition, regulation. And then over the last 10 years, the focus has shifted towards mainstreaming digital technologies across the entire portfolio of the World Bank's projects. That's bringing digital technologies into all areas of public service delivery, private sector development, research, and citizen engagement. Now, digital and the internet as part of that is now a central pillar of the World Bank's portfolio. And there are a few projects being approved now which do not have digital as a core element of the project design. And supporting that is a very broad range of research and policy being undertaken in the digital area. Looks at the, look, this looks at the economic impact of digital at all levels of the economy and society, the macro all the way down to household impacts and individual impacts on income, equality and inclusion. Technical and economic regulation of digital is a central, remains a central part of the, of the research agenda and this evolves as the topics, areas of focus have evolved from telecoms regulation through to digital regulation, data protection and so on. That research program has also evolved. Strategy for promoting infrastructure development and usage remains a, a key element of the, of the World Bank's research. And they use the ways in which digital can be used to modernize public service delivery um, is becoming increasingly integral to our, to our research program. So in addition to the research and analysis, we are strongly committed to integrating digital into our finance, financial support for client countries. In the digital sector itself, we're financing the rollout roll of broadband networks in rural areas, high capacity transmission networks, both terrestrial and submarine, that help bring digital low cost bandwidth to developing countries. We're supporting countries to strengthen their capacity for data protection, cybersecurity, and data regulation across the full area of digital governance. And we're also helping countries to integrate digital technologies into their core government functions, promoting reforms and process redesign, re-engineering in governments and the delivery of services, uh, public 
facing services delivery via digital technologies. Looking ahead, the agenda is evolving rapidly. We're increasing our focus on the role of digital in green and inclusive development. We're actively looking at the relationship between digital and climate change. This works in creating insights and knowledge around how digital technologies can be deployed to support countries' efforts to address climate change. And we're integrating this research directly into the design of digital projects. And looking ahead, we see the amount of um, digital, the use of digital technologies towards climate, addressing countries' climate change mitigation and adaptation strategies as an increasingly significant component of our projects. Our work on governance and regulation is targeted primarily at the country level. We help governments build, um, countries build the institutions that they need to ensure fair, transparent and safe digital environments. Internationally, we also work closely with partners in areas of digital development. This collaboration is particularly strong with other institutions that are also having a primary focus on digital, such as the ITU and the UN agencies that we've been hearing from today. Now, looking ahead, our work on digital will continue to grow. Um, digital technologies will become increasingly integrated into our portfolio. and We're increasing our focus on governance, regulation, data protection and cybersecurity. We also intend to be placing even more emphasis than we have done in the past on digital inclusion in all its dimensions so that everyone in the developing world is able to take advantages of the benefits of digital and to ensure that as the world becomes increasingly oriented around digital delivery, no one is left behind. Thank you. Thanks very much, Mark. Um, I'm afraid we don't have time to engage the audience, um, but I think what we have had is a very rich um, um, sense of the depth, but also the breadth of the work that involves digital across the UN system. In fact, it's immense, I think. And I think, as Mark Williams just said, it's going to grow. And I think this means that the challenge within the UN system to ensure that you work together, that we work together with you, in, you know, as a broader multi-stakeholder community is immense. Just one thing that also really struck me is that there's also so much overlap between your engagements, their specificity, you're all engaging the sphere in very specialized ways. You in, providing immense resources to member states through doing that, but there's also a lot of overlap. And I think perhaps that's the place of the IGF. It exists in that overlap. And I also heard um, really resonance with the IGF themes for IGF 2021, um, social and economic inclusion, universal and meaningful access, trust and security, climate change, emerging regulation, um, and digital cooperation. So um, I do trust that the IGF can be of service um, to, to yourselves and be a bridge between um, all this depth of knowledge and this broader community that, that does come together at the IGF. Um, I'm afraid I don't have more time, but if, if Mr. Liu and, and um, um, uh, Francesca, if you wanted to make any remarks, oh, it's completely over. So on that, thank you very much, everyone, um, for coming to the session. Apologies that we started late, and look forward to more of this type of engagement at future IGFs. Thank you. <laughs>